So again, um, as uh, uh, I was mentioning, um, Chris Anderberg works at SCCR as quality and compliance manager. Um, she uh, has over 30 years of research experience working for uh, academic research organizations and industry. Her knowledge extends to clinical trial management uh, for glo global studies, GCP, compliance audits, uh, regulatory agency inspections, uh, uh, clinical event adjudication, quality management of clinical trials, and policy and procedure development. So thank you so much, Chris, for being here with us, and I appreciate your time, and I hand it over to you. You, you are muted, Chris, you are muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. There, that should be good. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I've had these twice this week. Um, thank you very much, Susan, for the very nice introduction. I'm very excited to be here. And I wanted to spend our time together talking about quality incident reporting. And you'll see as we go through, we're going to be talking about Kappas. And I am hoping that by going through this, it will make your Kappa reporting easier for everyone. Um, I think everybody tends to get very nervous when they see, oh my goodness, I have a Kappa. I've got to fix it and make sure that we don't do it again. And um, to me, Kappas are learning opportunities. So I think if we can maybe change our frame of mind to this is all a learning process. We learn every day and this is how we're gonna fix it. Yes, we know that there was an error, but we're gonna fix it and we're gonna move on. So with that, let me, so our agenda today, we'll be talking about quality incidences. We'll be reviewing Kappas. I have an example that we're gonna walk through and then um, an exercise we'll divide up into groups and I'll give you um, instructions as we get there. And then I'll answer any questions that you, you might have. And please feel free to drop questions in the, the chat. Um, Susan, if you could help me um, monitor those. So I'd be happy to um, stop and answer those questions because sometimes it's very relevant to the topic Absolutely. Absolutely. and don't want to go back and forget something. So, all right. Moving on. So a quality incident is defined as a deficiency or a non-compliance. It can be with a regulation. It can be with our protocol. It can be with um, controlled processes, SOPs that we have um, in our departments or a business process. And the, the negative impact will affect one or more of the areas below. So for patient safety and well-being, obviously that is, that is number one. We wanna make sure that our patients are safe. Um, number two is data integrity. Three is the clinical trial or study integrity. Four would be our organizational reputation. And then five are contractual or sponsor obligations. But many, many, many years ago, um, I was a research coordinator. And this is when stents were just coming out, the coronary stents. Um, so back in the, the 90s. And I was sitting in the cath lab control room listening to my PI as he was getting ready to put in a study stent. And when I heard him say that he was going to put it in in a certain way, I, I, it shocked me because all of a sudden I was like, oh my goodness, that's, that's a protocol deviation, also known as a quality incident. So I rushed into the, the cath lab itself and I said, sorry, you can't do that. That's a protocol deviation. And my doctor looked at me and said, duly noted and proceeded to do as he was doing anyhow. So when we look at 
patient safety and well-being in the little scenario I, that I just gave, um, there's a possibility that what my doctor was doing could have harmed the patient. Um, you know, he was doing something that was basically off label and we didn't even have a label because it was all, all um, still, still experimental. He also could have affected the data integrity. The reason being is that now our, our patient doesn't fit the trial inclusion exclusion. And um, if he continued to do things like that um, and others at other centers did as well, then you're looking at a trial that's not gonna have the good data that you want. Same with the clinical trial or study integrity. If you've got people using a device that um, off label, it is obviously going to cause problems with your study integrity. The organization reputation, um, yeah, people might not want to work with us to do studies because we're not following the protocol and we're not giving the sponsors the the trial data that they need. And we are also not following our contractual obligations with the sponsor. So another way I want you to look at this too, because it's quality incidences can be very gray. They're not black and white. So again, this was back in the 90s. This was a new development, a new device being implanted into patients. Um, if the patient couldn't have a balloon angioplasty where the, the doctors would go in through the groin and up into the coronary arteries of the heart and they would blow it open with the balloon and hold that balloon open for a while um, and then deflate it and hope that that artery would stay open. Um, if that didn't work, the majority of these patients ended up going for bypass surgery, which obviously is um, not something that you really would like to go to um, firsthand. I mean, it's um, the survival rate is amazing, and you know, you get 15 years out of new vessels usually. But um, if you can do it with a simple cath that goes up through the groin, that's optimal. So when these stents came out, they became almost emergency use products. So going back to my little scenario there, the participant safety and well-being, we could have argued that, well, this patient was at high risk and couldn't go for bypass surgery. So by putting this stent in the way the doctor did, we um, actually saved the patient from going through um, bypass surgery. Yeah, we still messed up the data integrity and probably the clinical trial integrity. Um, maybe our organization reputation, but we also did something that was saving the patient. So this is what we call emergency use. Um, and through emergency use, you would have to get IRB approval. You would have to have two different physicians review the case to make sure it's okay to proceed. Um, you would have to have sponsor approval. So just wanted to share that there's different ways to look at all quality incidences. Um, and the, the most important takeaway is that we really should be following the regulations, our protocol, and guidance documents. Um, and also just on a side note that quality incidents can happen at the study level or they can happen at the process level. So your SOPs um, or directly in the study as I just discussed. All right, so there's quality incidents. So how is a quality incident identified? Normally, you're going to find these through monitoring or audits, inspections. Um, when your monitors come in, they'll, they'll see 
where you didn't follow the protocol in a certain area, and they're going to write that up and ask you to complete a CAPA. What we're going to try to do, especially for SCCR, and I don't see why there's any other reason that you might not have this procedure, but you can't think this way, is to self-report. If you are taking over a study or um, in my case, walking in and saying, doc, you're not doing this the correct way, you're, you report that, you make a note of that. Yes, we have identified this and upfront you create that kappa. You let them know that yes, we found this and we're going to improve our processes to cover this so this doesn't happen again. Um, you're gonna hear me say process improvement throughout this presentation and it, it's very important. It's not the be all, the end all. Um, a lot of times I think when you see a kappa, you are immediately saying, oh, we just need to retrain. We need to retrain everybody. They're not following the directions. But that's not always the case. Um, a lot of times it's your processes are not explaining exactly how you should be um, following the protocol or following a process. And, you know, this empowers people. Um, and probably the biggest thing with the self-reporting is we've always heard that CAPAs are bad, but I, I really want to try and change everybody's mindset that it's a learning opportunity and we're going to correct it. Hopefully there's no harm done to any um, patients or participants, and we're going to make it better on the, the other end. So with a quality incident-based system, we classify these events, and they are um, classified based on the severity of impact, and we have classes one, two, and three. A class one is going to be your most severe and if this quality incident issue is not stopped or resolved, it will continue or is expected to cause harm to patients, participants. A class two is if it's not resolved, there's a potential to cause harm. With a class two, it could be that you'll need to complete a root cause analysis and um, a kappa, or it could be that um, you caught it, it's not quite critical enough to require root cause analysis. You pretty much understand what happened and you're going to move on. Um, and then a, a class three is where there is currently no cause for harm. Um, if it continues, there is a potential. So let's go back to a class one and um, give you an example. So let's say you're um, dosing your patient and you realize that they're hypotensive all of a sudden. So their, their blood pressure has dropped. So you go back and you look at your dosing card um, and your protocol and you realize that you had been giving the incorrect dosage to your participants all along. Um, that would be a class one because if you continue down that path, um, you have a potential of somebody going into cardiac arrest, um, dying. So you're going to stop that immediately and fix whatever is broken to um, make sure that doesn't happen again. For class two, if lab work is required at certain intervals and you're not, you missed an interval, if the blood work was perhaps titers for a medication that you're giving. And if you missed that draw and continued to give medication, that would be 
a class two that would require a root cause analysis. If you, um, it was just a, a simple blood draw for routine, um, just a routine med and they were routine labs and they weren't using those labs for anything to, for treatment, um, that would be a class two without an RCA. And then a class three, I had a hard time um, coming up with these. You don't see them very often. And so an example, I would say, if you're required to sign a, a form on the day of the procedure, but you didn't sign it till the next day. Currently, it's not causing any harm. Um, is there a potential that if this continued to happen again and again and again, it could cause harm? I doubt it, but it would just all depend on the situation. All right, so with the quality incident, the actions that we will take, again, are similar to the Kappa, and you know, Kappa is part of this, but the first item that you're going to do is that immediate action that is going to contain the quality incident so it doesn't spread to other participants, it doesn't spread, um, cause the data integrity issues, you're stopping it. it. It's thinking of a correction, um, it's really more of a containment. So what are you doing that stops that issue from continuing? And that's with all QIs, um, not just a, a one, two, um, or two with a root cause. It's all, you know, even a, a, even a class three. Um, the corrective action, as you know from CAPAs, is, is to prevent recurrence. So what, what are we looking at that's, that we need to stop this from going on? And it's sometimes really difficult to differentiate between a corrective and preventive action. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in some of our scenarios. So the preventative or preventive is to prevent future occurrence. And then there's also a way that we can check to make sure that our process improvements or what we have done to prevent this QI issue from happening again through effectiveness checks. And effectiveness checks are going to um, identify if your corrective action and preventative actions are actually working. These are usually seen only when you have a root cause analysis, um, but not all of the um, CAPAs require an effectiveness check. All right, so back to our QI process. So we've got the correction and the containment. That's our immediate action that we are going to stop that QI from continuing. And then we need to write up a summary as to what is going on. Um, and this is where I think it's going to help you with your Kappa. So in the QI summary, we want to identify who, what, where, when, and so what. With the who, I don't want to know names. This is so important that Kappas and QIs should not be punitive. We don't want to be pointing fingers at anyone. We just want to understand what role this person was. So it could be your coordinator, a tech, um, a PI. And then you're gonna explain the event that happened. Um, and, and where did it happen? Was this in the database? Was this at a site? Was this with the sponsor? 
and then the time frame. And then most importantly, so what? And the so what goes back up to the, did this cause any harm to our patients? Data integrity issues, clinical study integrity, um, our relationships with our sponsors or our investigators. So it's most important that you really think through what, what the effect is going to be. So one of the, probably the most classic way to do a root cause analysis is the five whys. It's, it's my favorite way. Um, other people like the, the fishbone diagram where you have the cause and the effects. Um, I like asking why until I can no longer ask why. You can ask why three times, four times and get an answer, or you might have to ask why five times until you get that answer. So if in a situation where um, you have a quality incident that the PI didn't sign the um, case books in time. Well, why? Did he not realize that? Or that he had to sign? Did he forget his password? Um, he or she forget the passwords? Um, the emails aren't getting through. Some, there's a glitch in the, in the database that won't allow the PI to sign. So you just keep asking until you can no longer go any further. Chris, there is a question. Um, yeah. Uh, please speak in uh, some more details uh, about cap house that do not require an effective check. Sure. Um, so typically a CAPA that... Um, doesn't require an effectiveness check would be something that you didn't have to do um, a, a root cause analysis on. I, I have rarely seen effectiveness checks um, until I came to Stanford. I think they're a great idea. And um, there's, there's really nowhere written that you have to, to say, okay, I've updated this SOP, so in six months I'm going to make sure that it worked. Is it best practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but in, in general terms, you do not have to, but I would highly recommend things, um, effectiveness be done. Chris, thank you. It's, it's Elizabeth Anderson. I had requested that information because I think it's, we really need to know if it prevented, if it did what it was doing. So it's, it's really not about what the rules are written in some external source of what quality management is, but it's yes. what is good practice for our patients, for our compliance. So for the Cancer Institute, we consistently ask for effectiveness checks and uh, so I just, I know there are a number of folks from CCTO on the line. So I want to yeah. just um, also get your perspective on that. Thank yeah, you. no, I, you're, you're welcome. And thank you for the question. Um, it is important. And, you know, sometimes you won't have an effectiveness, in effectiveness check in place. And um, the next trial comes up and the same mistake is made. Well, had you had that effectiveness check in place, you might have realized that it had been not happening all along. So it's, it's, it's very important, especially when you're changing um, policies and procedures that, you know, are affecting our participants. So great question. All right. So what's next? I hope you can see that okay. Um, Maybe um, before we move to next, uh, there is another yeah. question. Uh, what about C, uh, RCA? Are they done as a separate document submitted with, with the CAPA? That would depend on how your system is set up. I can tell you with SCCR, it will be a separate system. Um, 
it'll be all inclusive in our we're going to put it all this into red the um, red cap cloud and what our group is going to do is going to submit the the quality incident answering all the who what where when why and so what and then somebody from our quality group is actually going to look at this quality incident and we're going to triage it so um, i have a, a slide on that at the the end just as an, an fyi um but we're going to triage it to see if it's a class one a class two class two with an rca or a class three and then we're going to come back to you and say we need to have a root cause analysis and we want you to pull a team together who were all a part of this, um, the quality incident, and ask those whys until you can get no further, or do the fishbone dry diagram with the cause and effects. Um, and then you're gonna submit that, and you'll ha also have the corrective, preventive, and um, effectiveness checks. And we're gonna see what the cause was in the quality group how do you plan on correcting that and how are you going to prevent that from going on and then we're going to watch and see to make sure that that works i hope that helps so it'll all be in one system but separate forms and i'm not sure that there's any right or wrong answer as to whether you put it in the same document or not. Chris, may I ask another question? Absolutely. Please. So I'm curious on your thoughts about um, when singular events become in aggregate, uh, it's just to use your class numbers. So you have multiple class threes, which then become clearly a pattern of noncompliance and elevates the importance. So I think that's something that we all struggle with is yeah. you get so caught up in your day-to-day -day that you don't necessarily see that we're con this is consistently happening and how that can escalate or where, where there's a pause in, in a root cause analysis. So can you just speak to that for this group? Yeah, of yeah. Um, absolutely. So with this quality incident reporting that we'll be doing in SCCR, we will have all the data, like I said, in Red Cap Cloud, and we will able to pull reports. We will start looking at trends. Um, we will see if the effectiveness checks are working. And through the, the trends, if we're seeing that, you know, each one of our different therapeutic groups are making the same mistake, we will um, go back and look at the, those quality incidences. And then in the, the quality group, along with pulling in people from each one of the other therapeutic areas, we'll look at this as a group and say, okay, this is continuing to happen. We are now saying that this is a class two with a root cause analysis. Let's see how we can eliminate this. So I think the most important thing in this, Elizabeth, is making sure that we can track through these reporting structures. And that's why it's so important to get it into a database. Thank you. You bet. All right. So another question, or you want to yeah. say this for later? No, go on, go on. This is good. Okay. <laughs> Who decides on the classification of the incidents? And how do you handle it when there, there are different opinions on the incident classification? Right, so um, the, the quality group will be um, classifying through the triage. We will have set definitions and um, we'll get there towards the end so you can see how we are going to triage. Um, and my gut is always going to go the most conservative route. And I think most poli 
quality people f agree that um, if we're going to take the higher road. So is this truly a, a root cause or a class two that requires a root cause analysis? We're going to ask that be done. Okay. Any other questions? These are all great. No, I guess we can move on. <laughs> okay. So with the, the, the Kappa, so we have, we've done our corrective action. Now we want to correct or eliminate this root cause. So what are we going to do to um, prevent that from happening again? So let's say that there was um, an email that was sent to um, a, on a master list and um, there was a person that needed to be removed. So what's our corrective action we're gonna do right then? We're going to update that list and remove that person. So for preventive, these are actions that we're going to take to eliminate the root cause of a potential QI to prevent future occurrences. So with this scenario, um, we are going to put into place that a master email list be reviewed quarterly, monthly, whatever we decide to make sure that people who are no longer on this trial are not receiving the email information. And then the effectiveness checks, we're going to review the emails to make sure that people who are, um, we're not, we're gonna review that list and make sure that we are not sending the emails to people who shouldn't be. And the effectiveness check is a planned activity following the completion of a quality incident that is going to evaluate to see if there, the progress, if the effectiveness um, is preventing that from happening again. Or do we need to go back and start over or tweak some things? The follow-up question is who will be in the tri triage? Um, so we have our quality group that will be a part of that. Um, and if we have questions, we will ask the, the group or the persons who submitted that um, quality incident. So if we're reading through a quality incident and things don't quite make sense, then we will go back and ask for the questions, but ultimately the decision will be made by the quality team. And I know from history that there's times that some groups don't always agree with the decision. And you know that's times where we can get together and talk things through. And we'll explain our perspective and listen to your perspective and then hopefully come to a consensus. All right. So now we're gonna walk through a sample. Um, this is a true um, event that happened and um, Let's just get started. Okay, so this is an example of a class two quality incident that did require a root cause analysis. Um, just to set you up a little bit, this was an institution that um, had clinical events adjudication that they were responsible for. And as part of a um, packet of documents that have to be put together for physicians to review the event. Um, data is pulled from the case report forms that are completed by the clinical sites. Um, and then source documents, medical records are added to that information. 
and then the investigators will have the information that they need to review the case to see if it was um, a positive adjudication or a negative adjudication. So when the lead coordinator went to pull one of these patient profiles, she noticed that there was a whole bunch of blanks on the, the report, on the form. And that data is critical for the doctors to review this document. So the first thing that she did was to go back to the case report forms and see if there was data truly in these fields and or if they were blanks and there was data. So she pulled the report again and there were still blanks. And then she went to a different subjects or participants record and pulled a report, patient profile, and there were still blanks. So now we know that there's blanks, the documents are complete in the, the clinical database, but for some reason it's not pulling to these patient profiles. And we also know that these reports were validated, validated and had um, user acceptance testing completed on them. So they at one time were working and now all of a sudden they're not working correctly. So what are our next steps? Um, she immediately notified the team that the reports were inaccurate. They had to stop all adjudication because again, the reports were inaccurate. And then she canceled any um, committee meetings that were also result were happening because of the adjudication. So right there, without even thinking too much about it, she has done the correction. These are immediate actions that she has done to contain the quality incident of having the black, blank reports. Um, and just to, you know, going back to the list of how does this uh, affect um, patient safety and um, so on and so forth. So now the study team can't work. So this is, has the potential to cause problems with our sponsor. We're not meeting our contractual agreements. Um, we're having to cancel meetings. And potentially, we're pushing out our timelines to get this adjudication done at the appropriate time or by the appropriate time. Oops, that was not supposed to happen like that. Sorry about that. Um, so. So now we're doing some detective work and um, the coordinator has gone to the data manager and reviewed what's, or explained what's happening. So now the data manager is going to review these transfers of the, the case report forms from the CRO to the adjudication group. And some of the first questions that the data manager is going to ask, you know, was the coding updated? Why is this, why are we not getting all the, the data that was there before? Um, and by doing this, the process of elimination, um, it was discovered that the, the CRO had made updates to the clinical database. And unfortunately, when they did that, they changed the coding, which then didn't allow the information to pull correctly from the clinical database into this patient profile. And, um, you know, they, their work doing their stuff, the CRO is doing their stuff, updating their database and not really thinking about the adjudication group because that's, you know, not the second, it's not second nature to them. It's, you know, another group that's using their data, we're pulling the data, um, but 
just didn't even dawn on them that this could affect somebody else's work. And there was no documentation ever that said um, that if they made changes, they needed to let other groups know. So this is not working. So basically now what you have done is you've started your root cause analysis. And I apologize that this isn't, isn't working. So we're gonna ask our, our whys. So why the coding wasn't updated? Well, why? Well, the, the reports were missing the data because the coding was updated. Well, why did that happen? Well, the CRO made updates to the clinical database. Well, why did they do that? Well, they needed to update their data, their case report forms, and they didn't realize that it was going to affect downstream. Why? Well, again, they, there's nothing written, so they didn't understand that it would cause problems down line. So that's how it was supposed to work. You're, um, now you've already completed your root cause analysis with the five whys. And this is just working through systematically as to, you know, our data manager going, hey, this isn't happening. Why isn't this happening? And was able to answer those five whys. So now what? So the next thing we had to do was get in contact with the CRO and say, hey, um, when you make updates, you need to let us know. And we decided to add instructions into the project management plan, information that said if any data was updated to the CRFs in the clinical database, we needed to be notified. And this project management plan was signed off by the CRO as well as the sponsor and as well as our institution. Um, and then we trained the CRO and the sponsor to the new um, PMP. It was signed off and released. So now we've just completed our preventative action. So this is how it's going to prevent going forward. And um, an effectiveness check for this would be very simple to um, over the next three or six months of this trial, we're going to be reviewing the patient profiles to determine um, if there's any blanks. All right, so um, in question, uh, yeah, to elaborate a little bit more on fishbone process. Sure. Um, let me go back. I'm not sure if that question could wait to the end or do you want to answer it now? No, I can answer it. So the, the fishbone, again, I don't know if you can see this very well or not. Um, you're going to start out drawing your, your little fish bone and you are going to enter what, so instead of saying why, you're going to say, what's the cause? Well, the cause was that um, the, the forms were blank because your cause was, I'm sorry, your cause was that the, um, the database was updated. And then what was the effect? It caused our information to be blank. And then, well, your cause number two is here's our information is blank. So how come it's blank? The effect was that the case report forms were clinically updated or the clinical database was updated and it caused the blanks. Um, I 
have to admit that I am not a fishbone diagram person for this type of thing. I've done fishbone diagrams for other um, research areas, but not so much for um, root cause analysis. But if you do want more information, I'm more than happy to do some searching and get that to you. All right. All right. Don't get sick while I'm going. Okay. So from this example that we just reviewed, what would you say that um, our nonconformance would affect? Would it be patient safety and well-being? Probably not. Um, it, no decisions are being made by what we're doing on how the patients are treated medically. Um, so nothing for the patient safety or well-being. Data integrity, absolutely. If this was not caught and resolved, um, incorrect information or blanks would have been um, sent off to adjudicators. They wouldn't have had enough information to truly adjudicate the event. And um, instead of having definitive adjudication results, you would get, sorry, not enough information to, to review this. And that would then potentially lead into, you don't have the data that's needed to approve the product that you're studying, whether it's a drug or device. So now you've affected the, the clinical trial or the study integrity. Organizational reputation. If this was um, a group that was doing work for a sponsor and you gave them results that were not good, you know your reputation is gonna, going to drop. And then contractual or sponsor obligations. Obviously, we're delivering, but we're not delivering the best information. So it will affect the contractual obligations to your sponsor, with your sponsor. Any questions before we move on to a, a class exercise? Okay. So what, um, Susan has six different scenarios. Um, and we're going to divide up into groups. And I'm not sure how many people are on the call, how many people you'll have to divide, Susan. But what, what I'd like for you... 27 for now. Um, okay. Or actually, that includes us. But uh, we have six scenarios that I emailed you. Um, so please uh, let me know if you haven't received the email. Uh, we emailed out six scenarios. And we are going to divide up to six rooms. Correct, uh, Chris? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So review the scenario. These are all real life scenarios. Um, identify the who, what, where, when, and so what. Um, these are all spelled out really simply. They're going to have the corrections. Um, you know, review those corrections, see if you agree with them. That's going to be, you know, stopping that from continuing. And then you'll have a root, root cause analysis to read through, um, see if you agree that they find they got to the end of the whys or um, you know they got to the root of the, the issue and then review the corrective and preventive actions and see what your thoughts are and if you agree with those. So we'll give you about 20, 20 minutes, good Susan? 
Um, yeah, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, yeah. It, it definitely, uh, you will see a sign that says, um, you know, your session is ending and coming back to the main room. I'm going to stop recording. I mean, pause recording here. So we, when we are in breakout room, it's not silent there. So let me pause the recording. In and out of everybody's, in everybody's room, it sounded like everybody was having some really good conversations and thoughts. Are there any questions or concerns that you would like to discuss with the entire group? All right. So the last thing I want to share with you is the triage part that we talked briefly about. Um, so again, this is going to be with the SCCR group, which I now realize that there's a lot of us on the, this call. So um, in the quality group, we will be triaging. This SOP has been drafted. We're just working on um, the reports in red cap and Chris, uh, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Um, no. uh, you are not sharing your screen, or maybe this is just a conversation. You don't want to share the screen. I do want to share my screen. <laughs> so sorry. Thank you. Okay, but now it's not letting me. Hmm. Okay, now we're getting there. Okay. Um, so I'll back up real quick. So SCCR is, we're in the process of writing a procedure, an SOP for quality incidents. And we are creating the, the red cap database. Um, as you know, Banu, who is on the, the call has already created the Kappa portion. So this is really going to be simple to put the quality incident piece in. Dorn's been working on that. And um, so when we triage, we're, we're going to be reading this, the, the um, incident summary. We're going to be looking to make sure that all the information that we need is there so that we can successfully triage this appropriately. Um, you know, one of the questions we want to make sure is, is this truly a quality incident? And if it is, the, the class, of, do we have enough information to classify it? And, um, you know, class ones are pretty simple because they're very severe and you're going to most likely report this to a regulatory agency most immediately um, and start your root cause analysis, potentially stop the trial. Um, if it's classified as a um, two, is there enough risk that would require a root cause analysis? And um, the, the QI triager will also be able to recommend, you know, if if you do need to notify the IRB, if you do need to notify the sponsor, um, if there's any corrections we would like to see. And um, just to, to guide you through best practices for documenting and then help with the, the root cause, the, the potential um, investigation strategies to identify that root cause. And if we feel that someone outside of a root cause analysis team should be um, present, then we will also add members and or suggest members. And as I said before, there are times when the, the teams will not agree with the QI triage by the, the QNC group, and that's when we get together for discussions. That is all I have for today. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, I hope that understanding the, the quality incident reporting method with the, the five whys helps everybody with the um, CAPA process. 
Um, again, that's not an easy one, but hopefully with this and the root cause analysis, it's going to make that process a little bit easier for you. And I'll turn it back to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate it. This was very informative um, class workshop. Um, if there is any question, by all means, you can unmute yourself and ask your question or put it in the chats. If not, um, I just want to let you know that we, I will share a copy of the slides uh, with you after the class. I will email you a link for an evaluation. I've also, I'm gonna put also that link in the chats now. Uh, the, um, if, especially if you are required, if you are planning to collect uh, um, continuing education units uh, credit, uh, then you will need to make sure that you put your name in the evaluation as well. So this evaluation is required to be completed. Let me see. I so um, again, I will um, send a copy of the slides uh, along with the evaluation to you and please make sure you complete it uh, within 30 days uh, for credit and certification. Um, thank you so much, Chris, again, for your time and expertise. And thank you all for participating and joining uh, our workshop. Hope to see you in our future workshops as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Chris. You're so welcome. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.